All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday. Um, how how'd the quiz go yesterday? Easy? So-so? Pretty good? Pretty OK? All right. Um, for those of you who I met online, it was, it was lovely to meet you and, and sort of be able to see you face to face and put a, put a face to the name sort of thing. So that was great. Um, today, what are we going to do today? We'll, we'll review talking about uh, the article that we were reading um, on Friday. And then we will move on to, I think we'll move on to talk about civilizations and things like that before we start to get into our first civilization, which will be um, the civilizations of Mesopotamia. And so we may get to that today or uh, at the latest, maybe first thing tomorrow. Uh, and again, as for the quizzes, I'll try and have all those, mar all those marked and um, uh, I'll try and have them up, the marks up on student portal later this evening if I can. This is weird. I noticed there's a, there's a hand and then there's a hand in the... Okay, anyway, I'm going to stop playing around. Um, uh, Irina's here. Good morning to you. Um, or good evening, probably. Hadil's here. Good morning, Hadil. And Michelle's here. Good morning, Michelle. Um, okay, let's jump back into where we were because on Friday we were talking about the agricultural revolution. And I was, I think I said, although I'm not sure that I've convinced you yet, but I will try to convince you later, um, that this is really the biggest cultural change that humans have ever, have ever had happen. It doesn't seem like much, um, but really every aspect of our kind of modern way of living is, was made possible by this change. And had humans remained hunter-gatherers, uh, had humans never started to grow their own food, we would not be living on a planet the way that we are living on it today. It would be a very different, it would be a very different place had we not, had we not done this. And so we said about 12,000 years ago, depending on the part of the world that you're in, people start to grow their own food. And so to answer why this happened and how it happened and maybe what some of the effects were, we read this article, The Worst Mistake in the History of the Human Race, which is the least subtle title probably ever. But um, it's, it's not very subtle. But in it, of course, we know that Jared Diamond is saying, yeah, actually, it might seem like switching to agriculture was a great thing. And of course, people would have done it. How could they, you know, anybody can see the advantages of agriculture. But Jared Diamond is trying to say that, well, that's, you know, that, that's an argument that's not really built on very solid foundations. And he tries to provide a better, a better argument for us. And so I asked you a few questions. And so remember, at the beginning of the article, um, Jared Diamond was kind of reacting to this earlier theory, this progressivist theory. And the idea, of course, in that theory was that, yeah, human history has been a story of continuous progress. And of course, Yes, of course, people turned to agriculture because it was better. And of course, you know, with every kind of step of our history, you know, things have become better and better for humans. And I'm not really entirely sure that that's the case. It might be easy for us to believe it now because we've actually wound up in a pretty good place, have we not? Many of us. We live in a world with technology and lots of comforts. You know, I live in an apartment that's very warm and safe and has running water and all kinds of luxuries. I have good health care and I can easily access food that is good for me. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good things about living in, on this planet in 2021. And granted, you know, those luxuries that I have are not extended to every single person on the planet, but from at least my own perspective, living in 2021 is not that is not that bad but Jared Diamond is trying to say that probably wasn't the case all the time and it probably wasn't the case for early farmers right and so he's trying to make um, he's trying to make an argument that switching to farming from hunter gather from hunting and gathering was huge mistake right what does it say Sometimes you just have no excuse. Okay. Yeah. So he, yeah, the, the huge mistake. And his first premise was that actually switching to agriculture was um, detrimental to the health of 
these early farmers, right? They were relying heavily on one crop, and depending on where in the world you were, it might have been wheat or millet or barley or rice or what? Rice, rice yeah. But depending on where in the world you were, you were heavily relying on one thing. But what I was trying to suggest to you is that if you look at kind of the nutritional profile of those foods, they're not really that nutritious. They have calories, right? They have calories that you can burn, which is good, it keeps you alive. But when you look at vitamins and minerals and nutrients and amino acids and fatty acids and things that human bodies need to function, there's actually not that much in there that humans are, you know, that humans can use. So again, it will keep you alive, but there's just not a lot of nutrition in those things. And of course, nowadays, like I said, if you buy flour at the store, often the manufacturer will add vitamins and minerals into them. They will fortify them so that there's something good in them. But of course, thousands of years ago, that wasn't the case. And um, what we saw is that these people were certainly less healthy, right? They had evidence of disease, right, from living in large groups of people with poor sanitation. They did not grow as tall as hunter-gatherers did before. And again, I said that the height you grow to is in part genetic, but it also has to do with the nutrition that you, that you receive when you're younger. And if you don't get enough nutrition, you're not going to, you're not going to grow as tall. Um, we said that early farmers had a shorter life expectancy um, by probably about six or seven years on average, which is pretty significant. And we also saw evidence of enamel hypoplasia, which is a very fancy word, probably too fancy for grade 12, but there were defects in their enamel, right? So ch young children who didn't have enough to eat, their enamel actually stopped forming while their teeth were originally developing. And so you can see, I showed you some pictures. I don't think I have the pictures. Oh, I do. Um, you can see those little lines, those little ridges across the teeth. And again, they will, because you only form your enamel once in your life, those ridges will remain there for the rest of the person's life. So we can clearly see that this adult had some periods of malnutrition, of food shortage, when they were quite young. And Again, often you see this in farmers. You don't often see it in hunter-gatherers, or you don't see it quite as regularly. Yeah, so we, we saw evidence of disease here. This is, I, I'm not sure if I use the word or not, this is parotic hyperostosis, um, which is not a word that you need to remember either. <laughs> but you do need to remember that this is evidence of disease, right? And long-term chronic disease, not, you know, not a cold or a flu. Your bones are fine if you get the flu, but if you have tuberculosis, for instance, your body will start to react and will start to draw from its own resources to fight this disease. And you can see that happening here. You can see it happening in this skull here. This is referred to as cribra orbitalia, which is kind of the same thing, but just inside of the eye socket. Uh, and here I showed you some vertebrae, right, from people's backbones. And these are uh, from people with tuberculosis, and you can see they're all Swiss cheesy, and that's not, that's totally not normal, right? So this person was suffering with a disease for some time. And again, you don't see that with hunter-gatherers. They don't tend to have these sort of um, chronic diseases because, again, they, they don't have poor sanitation, and they don't, have, they don't live in really large numbers of people. We said in the article that early farming groups started to develop. De blah, 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 blah. I'm going to start again. <laughs> early farming groups developed class divisions, right? We said that farmers tend to want to own their land, right? Or at least own the rights to it. Something that hunter gatherers don't really, don't really do. They don't have a concept for land ownership. And so if you own land, suddenly you own access to the food supply. And if you own access to the food supply, then you can make other people <laughs> do things in order to give them access to food, right? You, you don't, this doesn't happen with hunter-gatherers because nobody owns access to the food. You just go and into the forest and find what you want to eat, right? But again, if, if, you know, if the king owns all the land, then you will have to do what the king says, or he'll drive you off the land and then you'll starve, right? So... 
land ownership has a lot to do with some people being able to gain power over others, right? And then Jared Diamond also suggested that farming, um, farming uh, initiated this sexual inequality between men and women that we see in basically every society today. Hunter-gatherers, again, are men and women are basically equal in terms of power and contribution in society. But farmers, we see there's more inequality. And in some cases, that inequality is quite, is quite extreme. And what I suggested to you here is that because having a big family on a farm is so useful, early farmers had big families. But that meant that women didn't really have a role in the production of food, right? They didn't own any land. They didn't do a lot of the farming. And so they became kind of dependent on men. And so they lost, they lost some of their power. And again, in a hunter-gatherer group, um, men and women depend on each other, right, in order to survive. But here, we had a situation developing where women started to rely on, on men to, to get access to food, right? And so the question that we wanted to answer too was if, if this was all true, if early farmers had class divisions and sexual inequality and malnutrition and disease and all these things, why, why would they have switched in the first place? And why stick with it once you've switched? And I think the answer that we came up with had to do with population growth, right? And carrying capacity. And so as hunter-gatherer groups got slowly bigger and bigger and bigger, um, even though, uh, even though usually hunter-gatherers take steps to limit their, their growth, as they slowly got larger, they would um, get to the point where they were exceeding the carrying capacity of the land, right? So do I have my little graph here? Yeah, I have my little graph. So nature provides a certain amount of food, right? And for a, for a certain population of humans. But again, once you go beyond there, either people are going to start to starve and die, which is pretty awful, uh, or you're going to have to innovate, right? And of course, one of the things I think we know about humans is that we're very good innovators, right? We're very good at figuring out new, new approaches and new technologies and new ways of doing things. And so humans do just that. They decide, well, we're going to start planting some food, right? We're gonna start clearing some land. We're going to help nature along. And in doing so, we're gonna raise the carrying capacity of the land and generate more food, which they absolutely do. But of course, as populations continue to get bigger and bigger, people have to invest more in their planted food. And eventually they get to a point where they're fully reliant on that food. Um, they're, they've met, they're settled in one place, they've got big fields, they're trying to farm those fields, and they need to do that in order to feed all of their people. And they can't really go back to hunting and gathering because for the most part, people have probably forgotten all of the skills that their hunter-gatherer ancestors had. But secondly, now there's too many people, right? Your, your population's up here, and the carrying capacity for hunting and gathering is down here. You can't, you can't get back down there unless a lot of people vanish, right? A lot of people die or go away somehow, right? So there's really no way, there's really no way back down. And so humans, as their population continues to increase, they continue to have to be innovative in their subsistence technology. And I would say that that's true. Uh, that's th that remains true today, right? As our population continues to go up and up and up, we will have to continue to be innovative in terms of how to get our food, right? How to farm, how to genetically modify organisms to be more drought or pest resistant or to mature quicker, how to, how to produce more food with the same amount of resources, right? And so I suspect we will continue to do that, right? And we, we have done it for the past 12,000 years. We've continually tried to figure out how to produce more food because there's been, every year there's more and more and more of us, right? If babies weren't so darn cute. Um, yeah. Right, and so people start to turn to agriculture and, and over kind of 
generations, they become fully sedentary, so they don't move around farming communities. And again, not everyone turned to agriculture, but once some people start to, hunter-gatherers that live in the region either have to move away and try to find somewhere that they can hunt and gather, or they'll convert to farming as well, right? And so eventually you get this situation where basically everyone is, everyone is, is farming, right? Everyone is a farmer. And so the first form of, of farming that people likely had was something called Swidden agriculture. And I don't know, honestly, I don't know why it's called this. Um, but what it means is that when you practice Swidden agriculture, you, let's say you come to a section of trees or something and you think, okay, this is where I'm going to plant my, my crop. You take that section of land and you burn it all down. Okay, so all of the trees, all of the grass, the bushes, everything, you burn it to, burn everything to the ground. And then on that burnt ground, you plant your seeds. Okay. And because of all that burnt material, that organic material, it actually makes the soil very, very rich. And so you get a really good crop yield those first, that first year or two because the soil becomes so rich. Um, so people started doing this. They'd burn down a section of land and plant their crop. They'd get a big <laughs> yield. Um, they're using just very simple tools, okay? So there's not a lot of farming technology here. Um, here's a... Here's a guy doing some Sweden agriculture. Doesn't look like it's very fun. He doesn't look very happy, but um, yeah, he's gonna burn down all of, that, all of that dead stuff there and plant his garden or plant his crop, right? Here you can see some, um, here you can see some people working with simple hand tools, right? Which again, would have been what these sort of early farmers or horticulturalists were using, right? Just Simple techniques, burning sections of land, planting crops, using digging sticks or hoes or some such thing. Very simple technology and kind of surviving that way. Uh, yeah, here we go again. Some people doing some very simple, very simple agriculture. Um, the benefit of, of Sweden agriculture is that it's very productive, right? So you burn down a section of land and you get very fertile soil, you get a lot of yield. But the problem is, is that once you farm that same piece of land for two years or three years or four years, your yield, the amount of, the amount of food it produces starts to go down, right? It starts to deplete all of the nutrients in the soil that were, that were there. And so what kind of happens is that s simple farmers or people practicing Sweden agriculture will burn down a section They'll plant, they'll farm there for a few years, and then they'll move, right? They'll move on and they'll burn another section and they'll plant their fields there. And they'll kind of rotate around, right? But again, it's very useful, it's very productive. This is the easiest way you can farm, by the way. It's the least amount of work that farming entails. But again, you can see that in order to kind of replenish the land, you have to wait in some places, 20 or 30 years for the land to regrow, right? And then you can burn it down again and sort of regenerate that same amount of fertility. Um, so again, when your populations are low, this, is, this works, right? If you've got enough land to you know, burn down a section and farm for five years and then burn down another one and farm for five years, and after 20 or 25 years, you eventually get back to that original plot, if you have enough land to do that, great. But again, population growth is, population growth continues, right? And eventually, there's not enough land to have that system of rotation going, right? People either have to rotate their fields more often, or they have to farm the same field over and over and over again every year. And so again, humans hit the carrying capacity of the land for simple farming, right? The populations continue to rise, and then you get to the point where, oh, that's, that's all the food we can produce with this, with this sort of subsistence strategy. So what do humans do? Again, they innovate, right? They find a new way. And that new way is actually 
um, what we would call intensive agriculture. Okay? And so intensive agriculture is a, a subsistence strategy where people are actually using more technology in order to farm the same piece of land over and over and over again. Okay? So they have technology like plows, they, they fertilize the land, they irrigate it, so they water it. Um, they might use pesticides of some sort. Of course, thousands of years ago, they wouldn't really be chemicals, they would be more natural. Um, but they, humans figure out ways to farm the same piece of land over and over and over again. And again, if you can do that, that raises the carrying capacity, right? The food, the, the land is able to produce more food, but you have to put more work into it, right? You have to do more in terms of, you know, manufacturing fertilizers and putting the fertilizer on the land. You have to maybe make pesticides. You have to be more careful about pests. You have to water your crops more frequently. There's a lot more work that goes into it, but it can be done, right? It can be done. And it, and it was done. Um, here's a, a very early depiction of intensive agriculture. And this comes from uh, the wall of a tomb in Egypt. And so you can see, here's a, here's a guy thousands of years ago practicing intensive agriculture, right? He's got his two oxen there. Um, what's that thing that the oxen are dragging behind them? What's it for? Yeah, it's for kind of turning over, turning over the land, right? It's a, it's a plow, right? It's a very simple piece of technology, right? It's made out of wood. Um, but yeah, exactly. It's something to, something to dig in the land. And so here they're using a piece of technology, the, the plow, and they're hitching, it to, they're hitching it to these oxen, right? And there he's got a little whip if the oxen get lazy. So whip the ox, right? Um, but yeah, here we see someone practicing intensive agriculture thousands of years ago. And some farmers are still kind of doing their farming in this, in this way. And so I think this picture here is from, is, is from kind of modern day Egypt in the Nile Delta. But here you can see a guy, you know, working his farm in very much a similar way to, you know, the way that ancient Egyptians would have done it as well. He's got a plow here. He's got his two oxen, and he's working his field, right? Um, yeah, so people who practice intensive agriculture are, again, using more technology and more, I'm going to use the word infrastructure, more infrastructure to in raise the carrying capacity of the land. And so here this is obviously a bit of an artist's rendition of, um, of what, an intensive agricultural society would be like. But you can see some of the things that intensive agriculturalists use, right? So here you can see there's a guy with a plow and two oxen, right? So he's plowing his field. Um, you can see that they built canals, right? They built a system to bring water from the river that you can see in the background there and bring that water closer to the field so that they can, so that they can water their crops, right? Um, here you can see some people um, maybe you don't see it in this one. Maybe it's the next one. Uh, in the next one, you can see, nope. Sometimes you can see people also storing their crops, right? So they'll have big storage structures that are made to store the grain or the millet or the rice, keep them away from pests like rats and birds and squirrels and things like that, and, you know, preserve that harvest, right? So. Intensive agriculture is a little different from simple farming or horticulture because of how organized the whole thing is, right? It's very large scale, large farms, large fields, irrigation systems like canals, pesticides, fertilizers, technology like plows, and a lot of people kind of working together to generate this amount of food. Um, again, sometimes you see different um, technological innovations show up too. This is, un I think this is in China, but don't quote me. I th it's somewhere in Southeast Asia, I'm pretty sure. And here you can see them terracing, terracing the land. I think that's where it's from. Uh, but you can see them terracing the land, right? So it's, it's, 
you can't really farm very well on land that is kind of rolling or that's very steep, right? But here they've cut or they built flat surfaces into the hillsides, right? In order to create more farmland where originally there was less, right? And that's an, that's an intensive agriculture, whoops, an intensive agricultural thing to do. So depending on where you live in the world, people start to innovate and find more efficient ways to farm the land that they have. Because again, populations rise and the amount of land available starts to shrink. So intensive agriculture is important to us for a couple reasons. One, again, it allows populations to continue to grow, which they do. And again, they've been growing since, you know, for the, for the past 300,000 years, our human populations have been growing and growing. Of course, recently they've gone up like that, but they've, they've grown for basically our whole history as far as we know. So it allows people to feed themselves and to create uh, the food they need or generate the food they need. But also, it does something else. Intensive agricultural communities are usually able to produce a surplus. They're usually able to grow more food than they can actually eat. And this is an interesting thing because for the first time in human history here, it allows people to do things other than farming or maybe not for the first time in human history, but for the first time since people switched to farming, it allows some people not to be farmers. They can do other things. And in doing so, they often start to create more complex civilizations and more complex societies. Here's how it works. So the whole thing starts off with intensive agriculture, right? So humans farming the same piece of land over and over and using technological innovations to produce that food. And again, they usually are able to produce a food surplus. So they can suddenly grow more food than they can eat. And this has kind of two effects in terms of civilizations. One is that it leads to craft specialization, right? So if we were all living in an intensive agriculture civilization thousands of years ago, and let's say Nicholas and Noah are farmers, okay? You guys are farmers and you grow, your, your farms are productive. And so let's say you grow enough crops on your farm, on each of your farms. Nicholas, your farm grows enough to feed three other families, okay? And same thing with you, Noah, your farm is going to produce enough for three families. So what does that mean? That means that you can feed your family and then there's three other families that don't have to farm, right? They can do other things. And so what can they do? Well, maybe they can raise chickens, right? Or maybe they can make clay pots or maybe they can specialize in building plows or raising oxen or making jewelry or making clothing or anything, right? They can specialize in a certain craft. And so, again, because you've got that food surplus, people start to be able to do other things. They can specialize in things, and then they can trade those things for the food that they need, right? And so suddenly, you've, because of this food surplus, you've got a little market happening, right? People are trading the clay pots that they make for the food they need to eat, right? And likewise, you're trading the food that you grow, Nicholas and Noah, for the clay pots and plows and oxen and chickens that you might need, right? So you have these little kind of economies starting to form where people are trading the things that they specialize in, okay? The other thing that happens has to do with the irrigation of these crops. So the first places that intensive agriculture develops, Egypt and Mesopotamia, um, both of those areas are very dry. And so what the people have to do is figure out a way to water the crops. And to do it, they build a system of canals and dikes and levees and all kinds of things. Um, now, to build those things, do I have a good picture of them? Nope. <laughs> to build those canals, um, you, you, need some, you need some expertise, right? It's not easy to build a canal that is hundreds of meters long and goes from the river to the field 
and actually will irrigate the field properly, right? You need some mathematical and surveying knowledge. Can you imagine building a canal that takes months and thousands of people to build, and then you realize at the end that you didn't get the angle quite right, so the river water doesn't come up the canal, it just kind of sits there? Oof, embarrassing, right? So you need some mathematical and surveying knowledge, right? You need people who, are, who know how to design a canal and lay it out and plan it. You need people to organize the labor to build it. And then, once it's built, you need people to maintain it, right? You need people to organize the, organize the, the harvest, make sure that after the, the wet season, everybody can get into the canal and clean it out and maintain it. You need someone to kind of organize all of these things, to look after the canals. And so what do we do? Well, we create a little group of people for that, right? People who are in charge of the canals. And how do we pay them because they're not farming? Well, we pay them with our food surplus. We give them taxes, right? So we pay taxes to this little canal administration and they're in charge of building and maintaining the canals because of course we all depend on those for survival, right? We depend on that water for survival. And over time, that administration will slowly kind of develop and evolve into something that looks like the beginnings of a state, okay? So we'll have a ruler, right? We'll have a person who's in charge of the canals and later of the society. We'll have bureaucrats, right? People who do the work of government, people who know how to read and write so they can keep track of whose farm is whose and who's paid taxes and who hasn't paid their taxes. And again, that's where, that's where writing comes from. I'm sorry it doesn't come from wanting to create great works of literature. It's actually accounting, which is a little bit sad, but that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's where it comes from. Um, so we have bureaucrats keeping track of the, the records of this little group. And then eventually we, want, we, we blah, blah, blah. eventually we might want an army, right? Because now that we've built these houses and farms and canals and we've stored away all this food in our storage centers, we don't want somebody riding over the hill and killing us all and taking our hard work, do we? No. So we create an army to protect us from people who might want to steal from us. And so all of these things kind of slowly evolve, right? So from a food surplus to, you know, craft specialization, a, a civilization with lots of different products that you can trade for, and then the sort of creation of this administration, right? First to look after canals and to organize people's farming activities, but later of course, as society becomes more complex, you need more, you need more government, right? You need some sort of law and order. You need maybe standard weights and measures. Maybe you need a currency eventually. Maybe you need money. You need somebody to run the army and to protect us from outsiders, right? And so all of these things will kind of develop from, um, from that intensive agriculture base. And again, Without a food surplus, none of it happens, right? You need, you need a food surplus in order to free up people to do other things. And so then they start to do other things. And so that leads us to the idea of civilizations and what they are. And again, this is a little bit of a holdover from the earlier version of this course that was called Comparative Civilizations, but it's, I think we could, it's okay to spend a minute or two talking about what civilizations are, okay? Um, civilizations are um, difficult to define because there's, there's a bit of a value judgment in the idea of being civilized, right? Um, and so, again, you can see here, it comes from the Latin act, uh, adjective civilis, civilis um, referring to citizens. And of course, that's really what civilizations are, right? Groups of citizens that come together and cooperate in a political and social and economic way, right? So to be part of a civilization is to be civilis, right? To be a citizen, to be someone who is living with other people and working together to survive, right? Um, sometimes we 
like to, or not like to, but we're kind of prone to think that civilizations are advanced, right? So civilizations are advanced and non-civilizations are primitive, right? Um, but really what we're, really what we're looking at here is, um, really what we're looking at here is the development of technologies, okay? And so some civilizations become more technologically complex and maybe more socially complex than others. But of course, it doesn't mean anything about culture, right? So it doesn't mean that, you know, the, the people living in a big walled city with big towers and gold and all kinds of things, it doesn't mean that they're any sort of better or smarter or more advanced than the hunter-gatherers who are living in the forest, right? It's just they've developed a different adaptation based on their environment, right? And it might have to do with an environment that's hot and dry. It might have to do with an environment that, um, you know, will not support that many people hunting and gathering. And so those people had to switch to farming a long time ago, right? And so, again, some people are able to remain hunter-gatherers. Some people begin to farm. And some people, that leads them to intensive agriculture. And then it leads them to creating these big, complex societies, civilizations, if you will. But again, it doesn't mean that one is necessarily better or more advanced than the other. It just means that they've had different histories and different kind of forces have shaped them. Okay. Um, yeah, so civilizations are kind of not just a bunch of people, but also a shared way of thinking about the world, maybe kind of uh, maybe that's expressed in their art or their architecture or their literature, if they have, if they have such a thing, and we'll, we'll see that. Um, and again, you know, we want to avoid the idea of thinking that, you know, what is civilized and what isn't, right? Because often things that are civilized are seen as civilized from a Western perspective, right? From a, a modern Western technological perspective. And, Again, you know, with anthropology and things like this, we don't want to, we usually don't want to make judgments about other cultures. We just want to understand them for what they are, right, and how they work and, um, you know, what their values are and, and how, how that culture operates. Um, so, yeah, don't, don't, don't let social complexity or technological innovation confuse, don't, don't confuse that with people themselves, right? People are you know, perfectly intelligent and capable and advanced on their own. But in some cases, you just don't need to develop certain things. A perfect example is writing, right? So most indigenous cultures in North America, they didn't have a written language. So they, they never wrote anything down. And it would be very easy to, it would be very easy to imagine that, oh, well, you know, they weren't smart enough to develop it. But that's not the case. It's just they didn't really have the need to write anything down, right? These agricultural civilizations were keeping track of tax records and things like that, and so they needed to write stuff down. But most indigenous cultures just didn't have the, there was just no need to write things down, and so they didn't. They could have, but it just wasn't useful, so they didn't do it. Yeah, So, so, Societies can be complex, technologies can be complex, but people, people are just people, right? They're not simple or complex. They're, they're just people living in different cultures, different societies, and different environments. Okay, are we good so far? Doing okay? You wanna take a little break? Yeah, Noah's giving me a thumbs up. Okay, let's take a little break. We'll come back, and I think we'll move on to Mesopotamia, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay, quick break.
OK. And we are back. So we just talked a little bit about how civilizations develop, right? And again, they're kind of formed based on intensive agriculture, which produces food surpluses. And it gives people the ability to do things other than farming, right? And other than collecting their own food, which people have been doing for their entire history, right? So this is actually a little bit different for humans in that not only are we kind of gr we're growing our own food, but you know it, it's never been possible for you not to be a producer of your own food, right? Hunter gatherers, um, hunter gatherers collect all of their own food. Simple agriculturalists or simple farmers farm their own food. Everybody's a farmer. But here, when we get to intensive agriculture, it's actually possible for humans to not farm, right? To not actually obtain their own food directly, right? And again, that's something that's very connected with most of us because I imagine most of us are not from, from farms or have no experience farming, right? But we eat quite well. And so this kind of starts, um, this kind of starts here as well. So these civilizations have some things in common and we'll talk about a number of them as we go through this course. And one of the things, like I just mentioned, they have specialization of labor, right? People do specific jobs and not everyone is a farmer. Um, they also have economic and political centralization. And so if you're gonna have thousands of people living and working in the same place, you kind of need some way to organize them, right? And to get them, to get them doing the, the, the same thing at the same time, right? So you need some kind of political centralization. You need someone to be in charge somehow. Um, hum both humans and domestic, or human, both humans and animals have been domesticated. Have you, have you heard the word domesticated before? D or domestic? What's that? Oh yeah, yeah, we, so we use it that way, right? So international versus domestic. So are you on a domestic flight or a international flight? Yeah, we use it that way. Um, we also use it to indicate something that has been tamed, right? So if this is, so I have a domestic cat living in my house, right? And the cat is, the cat is tame. It is not a wild animal. <laughs> it is, it's been domesticated, right? And Domesticated comes from, I think it comes from the Greek word domos, which is a house. So it's like a, a thing that lives in a house is something that has been domesticated. And so we've domesticated cats and dogs, right? They live in, um, they, they live in our houses, but we live in houses as well, right? Which is something that we didn't used to do thousands of years ago. And so not only have animals become domesticated, and to some degree plants have as well, but we've become domesticated. We are now things that live in houses, right? We're not, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're not wild humans anymore. We're domesticated humans. Um, civilizations often have monumental architecture. So big stone buildings, whether they're palaces or temples or walls to keep out the barbarians or canals or whatever it is, they tend to build big things, often of stone. Civilizations have taxation, right? So all of that kind of organization and infrastructure and rulers and bureaucrats and armies, all of that requires money, right? It requires payment. And so it comes in the form of taxation, right? Um, often civilizations feel that they are superior or better than the people living in the hills around them, right? So to live in the city, to live in the civilization is progress, that's culture, that's civilized. And the people outside of the walls of the city, well, they're a bunch of backwards barbarians, right? <laughs> that's, that's often the way that civilizations think of themselves. Um, and also civilizations are, are frequently expansionist. So they're usually not just happy with the land they have. They generally want to expand and conquer even more. 
Okay. Um, yeah, which quite natural, not not naturally, but um, quite conveniently brings us to Mesopotamia, and so that'll be our first kind of culture or civilization that we look at. Um, it's one of the most ancient ones on 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 our human planet. Um, for a long while, it was thought to be the first civilization ever to appear, but I believe there has been recent archaeological evidence from India that suggests that um, the cultures that were living in the Indus River Valley, um, kind of in sort of Western India, Pakistan kind of area, that those civilizations actually might go back a little further than Mesopotamia. But prior to that evidence, um, it, was, it was Mesopotamia that was thought to be the oldest one. Does anyone know anything about Mesopotamia or does, does anything come to mind when we, when we say that word? Egypt does? Um, well, it, Mesopotamia is not in Egypt, but um, certainly the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, were around at kind of a similar time, and they probably interacted. They, they, they traded and kind of fought with each other in different periods of history. So there's, there is a connection there. You're, you're very right. Um, anything else? Do you know where this place is? It's not really a term that we use anymore, right? Okay, well good, we'll, we'll learn something. Um, so Mesopotamia is called Mesopotamia because, um, because of what the Greeks called it. And the, the Greeks called it this because it, it means the land, between, um, the land between two rivers. Mesa is between, I think, and pot potas is river. Not potas, but potas is river. Uh, so it's a, yeah, it's the land between two rivers, and the two rivers are the Tigris and the Euphrates. They're very famous in the ancient world. Um, they're mentioned in the Bible, I believe. Um, this area of the world was thought to be um, the place where the Garden of Eden was, if you kind of believe in Christian background. Um, and and this is kind of where it um, where it was or where it is uh, re relative to modern terms. So. Here you can see Syria and Saudi Arabia and Jordan. Of course, those places didn't really exist thousands of years ago, but you can pretty clearly see, and in Iran, of course, and Iraq, um, you can pretty clearly see the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers there. And those were the rivers that people started to settle beside and farm beside and draw water from and, and start to create a civilization. So. Mesopotamia is kind of interesting because it's, a, it's an interesting contrast to ancient Egypt. Um, ancient Egypt developed just a little bit later than the Mesopotamian civilizations did, um, but they developed very differently and in some ways because of the environment that they lived in. And so, as we'll come to see, Egypt was kind of a unified culture and it was often unified under a single ruler, under a pharaoh. Um, but Mesopotamia was frequently not. It was frequently a bunch of little city-states that we'll get to that, that often fought with each other and allied with each other. And so it was a, it was a much different place than, than Egypt was, even though they lived in roughly the same time. Um, the other thing we should mention about Mesopotamia is that Mesopotamia is a place, but it's not really a culture. And so in Mesopotamia, there were a few different cultural groups that lived and thrived there over time. And so these Sumerian people here were kind of the first ones that we have evidence for. Uh, and then later they seem to be replaced by these Aka uh, Akkadians or Akkadians who come from um, further to the east, I believe. And then there's some old Babylonians that show up a little bit later, and then Hittites show up even after that. And so Unlike Egypt, or unlike Egypt that was full of Egyptians, um, Mesopotamia was a place that was kind of um, the, the location for a number of different cultures through the, through the centuries or through the millennia. So it was a little different that way too. We'll talk a little bit about the Sumerians and maybe a little bit about the Akkadians as well. Um, 
Yeah, people often refer to Mesopotamia as the cradle of civilization for a long time. Because again, these things happened here first, right? The rise of cities, of urban centers. There'd never been a city before, before, before they arose in Mesopotamia. And also the invention of writing, right? Something that we, something that some of you are doing right at this very second, something that we take for granted, but nobody had really ever written anything down in, in language prior to when the Sumerians started doing it thousands of years ago. So it's an important place for human history because some of the things that are still very common to our existence, right, living in a city, writing and reading, those things happened here, and for the most part, they seem to have happened here first, or almost first. Just a quick slide on dates and times. Um, you've probably seen these dates listed. Well, you probably saw them in the slide before, but you've probably seen them other places. And so just so we know what they mean, um, often years are listed in BC and AD. Um, those, those dates were kind of created with a bit of a Christian context, right? The original, the original idea being that Jesus was born in the year zero. And so everything before that was before Christ, right? Before Jesus was born. And everything after that was, um, was called A.D., Anno Domini, or after, after his death. And so the original idea was that he was born in about in zero, the year zero. They marked it. They started, the, they started it there, and then he died sometime, you know, in 30 A.D., 34 A.D., or something like that. Although I think more recent studies have shown that he was probably born in about 4 A.D. They kind of put, <laughs> they put the year zero in the wrong place, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Um, so, but again, that's kind of a very Christian way of marking time, right? And so for people in other countries or people who just aren't Christian, that almost seemed to be a little bit ethnocentric, right? It didn't really make sense for a lot of people. So some people have kind of modified it so that the numbers stay the same, but instead they're calling it the common era and, you know, before the common era. So you might see BCE or CE, uh, and it means the same thing as, it's, it's the same numbers as BC and AD. It's just that it, it's, it's a more kind of universal term, I guess. Uh, you might see BP, which is before present. So if it's a radiocarbon date, often they will list it in before present. And of course, a millennium is a, a thousand year period, right? So just a little thing on dates. All right, so yeah, so if, um, so if you see a date that's BC, you basically have to add 2,021 years to it to know how long ago it was, right? So these Sumerians, if they show up at 5,000 BC, that means that that was about 7,000 years ago, right? Because we have to count the 2,000 years that have come after, after that. Does that make sense? Yeah, so 5,000 BC was about 7,021 years ago. Um, right. So in Mesopotamia, we have evidence of people living there all the way from 10,000 BC, BCE I've used here, all the way from 10,000 BCE. So, so 12,000 years ago, we have evidence of people living in Mesopotamia. And it seems like this is, again, the time where people who might have been more mobile, who might have been hunting and gathering, start to kind of settle down and turn their attention to agriculture. And again, over time, more and more people are settling in that area and are born. And as numbers rise, there's more farming, more urbanization, so the, cr the creation of cities, and more complexity that comes from that as well. Oh, oh, and now it's your turn to do a little bit. Um, so from the textbook, I have a short section for you to read here, just a couple of pages, giving you an introduction to, um, to Mesopotamia. And I think I've got a few questions for you here. Ooh, I've got five questions. Um, so that's pages 25 to 27, and then I'll get you to answer these questions, and then we'll talk about what we've learned, okay? So 
maybe I'll just give you um, about 10 minutes for that. And then after 10 minutes, we'll, as I say, we'll, we'll talk about it, okay? I'll give my voice a rest.
Okay. Okay. 30 seconds. Maybe a little bit more. Two more minutes. Okay, we have a few questions to answer here, but what I'm going to do is, is I may press pause on the questions until tomorrow. And the reason is that we're going to have a fire drill in about nine minutes. Yeah, so for those of you who are in class here, what we'll do is we'll go out, we'll go down the stairs, we'll go out back, and we'll stand in that kind of, you know, that road that goes behind the college here, but we'll stand on the sidewalk. If you wouldn't mind, just stand together so that I can count you and make sure you're, you're all there and not, you know, trapped in the building, burning horribly in a fire. And once, um, once we do that, then we're good, okay? So maybe I'll, I'll let you pack up now. Um, if you want to leave your stuff here, it's okay because I'm going to lock this door. If you want to take your stuff with you, that's okay too. But I'll just give us a few minutes to kind of get prepared. Um, because that's going to be a little disruptive. But tomorrow we will um, tomorrow we'll, we'll pick this up and we'll talk a little bit more about our first culture, the Mesopotamian cultures of Sumeria and of Acadia. Okay, so um, that'll be all for today, my friends. Uh, I hope you have a nice afternoon, and I will see you all tomorrow. Okay, so bye.